Welcome back to another episode of Cactus Quest. In today's episode, I'm going to be sitting down with Gary Duke, and we're going to continue our conversation on the topic of plant conservation and kind of just exploring why it's important in the first place and why, as a collector, it's something that I should be thinking about at all. So let's go ahead and take a look. We're back together to really talk about, um, kind of to piggyback on the initial video that we had made. Um, I'm, you know, you're this video i'm expanding just a little bit more so you're one of four other four or five other people that i'm gonna ask kind of the same question to and it was a question that was actually raised by one of uh, one of the people that watched the video and the question is why why does it matter in the first place why should somebody as a collector even care about conservation or have that even be a thought to begin with why is it important why is it important um let me begin by saying that if you buy a collected or a poached plant, there's a high probability it's going to die. Um, I mean, with a lot of experience, maybe you get better at it, but you're probably going to lose a lot in, in the interim. So, I mean, so you're just kind of robbing nature of that particular plant and anybody else that wants to uh, enjoy that s sight of seeing that plant in nature. Right. So, um, from a conservation point of view, um, I think you're better off growing from seed. Um, once a plant is accustomed to being uh, in cultivation, it doesn't transplant to the wild too well. I mean, the op it just reverses the same. Right. So, you know, kind of the philosophy is keep the cultivated plants in cultivation and keep the wild plants in, in the wild. Right. Um, and both sides will be a lot better. Um, the other thing is if you, if you get a poached or, cult or a uh, wild plant, Mother Nature is not nice. And typically, it's probably going to have a lot of scars and um, damage to it, you know, and insects and animals taking a bite out of it here or there. Um, and so, it, when if you take it to a show, it's not going to compete as well. Right. Judges typically say, "Oh, this doesn't look as good as this one over here. That's perfect." You know, uh, it's a lot more quirky around the base. Uh, this one doesn't have that, th so we'll give this one a first. So right. you're not going to compete as well. And, and so it's, it's kind of like, I mean, there are people out there that will want a cultivated, I mean, I've had people say, I like the fact that it looks kind of, you know, beat on. Right. Well, I mean, that's, that's fine. You can beat on a cultivated plant too, but sure. And I, moving around in the military for 20 years and putting them in the trunk, I have a lot of marred up plants sure. from just moving them around. I mean, it, you can't really have a really old plant and have it absolutely perfect without a, a few spots on it someplace. Sure. It just age takes its toll. Um, but I mean, there's always somebody that, I mean, you know, that's why museums every once in a while have, have pictures, priceless pictures taken. Somebody wants it in their collection and to be able to say, I have it, even though they can't show it to somebody, you know? And those people are always going to probably be out there. It just, it's you know, it just doesn't make sense to me why you would want to have a, a plant or a picture in your collection that you can't show to anybody, because I mean, I mean, if people recognize, oh, that's a collected plant, you kind of look down on the person, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, do you want to be looked down upon? If you have have visitors, well, I, most people don't. I mean, there's a few people, I suppose, that would take pride. Oh, but I got this one. Right. I think one of the draws you know? that I see, like, uh, and it's particularly like, it's either with plants that are very slow growing, uh, that are hard, it's hard to get a massive specimen cultivated because it takes a long, long time yeah. to make them. Um, and then the other thing is you see plants, uh, agave utahensis being one, where a cultivated plant is never, no matter how much you beat on it, it's never going to look like a, you know, Utahensis that's growing out in a fissure of limestone out in the desert. 
uh, and copia poa scenario that basically the whole whole um, species of copia poa is the same way uh, I mean your copia poa is about as close as you can get it to looking like a habitat poa but it still doesn't look like a habitat poa it doesn't it's not quite the same um, I, so I think it's 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 that is a, one of the driving factors for a lot of people of why they want that but um, I think one of the one of the kind of points that for me that I think about and was one of the things that motivated me to grow from seed is really like you you touched on it before we well we were getting set up is that you go out and you take the the smaller plants out of habitat copia poa for example well there aren't any seedlings Rudolf Schultz's book he talks about it he did the updated version 10 years later there's no seedlings it's kind of a bleak picture of of that species in its habitat. So when somebody, for like, in my mind, if you go out there and you take a flowering size plant out of the habitat, you're taking an entire, like, it's like taking a, a father out of a family, basically, you know? Like right. You're taking that, that potential, or a mother for whatever, however you want to look at it, but you're taking that potential for uh, a new generation of seedlings to emerge from that plant. You're taking that, opportunity away from the desert completely and then like you said you're putting it into the hands of somebody who wants the plant for whatever your reason is and i'm not here to judge you for it but uh, for whatever your reason is and then you take it and you have it for you know the three or four or five years that it takes for that plant to die basically you know? right so um i think that's for me is like one of the things everybody loves seeing the photos they look at uh like the photos of these plants out in habitat and they look so majestic and you get to see them in context of how they're growing out of the rock and all the stuff people appreciate that so so much that it's like if you're appreciating the plants and you're collecting the plants i think you you owe it to yourself and to the plants and to the rest of the community and the rest of the people that appreciate those plants to kind of look at it from a 360 degree point of view and and consider the impact of that plant coming out of habitat and is that something that you really want or would you prefer to have those plants there so that you can you know tell somebody about it when you're uh your age and then they can go out and they can go find it and see it and it's still there or you know would you rather just have them all collected and in pots somewhere I, I i hate to say this um and i won't say what race the person was uh he was a different race than i was um i am um but I used to work with him, and he said when he went back to his his country, uh, because he still had family back there, he says, he says if they get the slightest cold, they immediately go to the doctor and say, give me a pill, I wanna be well tomorrow. Right. They wanna be, he said, their whole population, I want a pill for this, I want a pill for that, I wanna I want get well right now. You know, when, Probably it's best if you just let the cold linger, you build up a resistance to it, you know? And we need more of a bonsai uh, society type of mentality than I want a quick fix. Uh, bonsai, the Japanese take very good pride. This is the plant that my grandfather tended. Right. You know, this is a hundred years old or right. something, you know? I take pride that I've got plants in my collection that are 35 or 40 years old. Right. And I have tended them, and yeah, they've gotten marred up a bunch, but I, I have to say that now that I am older, I take pride in that. And um, we need more of that bonsai type of mentality where you are taking care of the plants that some elderly person has had, and you can keep it going. Right. Um, because these, some of these cacti grow, I mean, can be very, very old. Sure. Well, I think too, it's like um, remembering that when I go out and I buy this plant and I bring it home, yeah, I may have initially been attracted to it for its, uh, you know, architectural beauty or whatever, its form, its colors. There's various reasons why people are drawn to the, the look of a plant. But when you get it home, you've got to remember this is a, a living thing. It's a living mm -hmm. organism. So yeah, you it is it is uh, it's a long game. And I think I think some some of what I see is is uh, more of a sport approach to cactus collecting, like almost like trophy table um, 
like heads on a wall type of thing, you know, like he zebra head on a plaque. And it's like, I want to have the specimen now without having the 40 years of cultivating that thing, learning from your mistakes and doing all that. Like it really is like a, it's like a whole, it's a long game. It's more of like an art form than it is a sport really, you know, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's chess, not checkers, I guess, sort of, you know what I mean? So it's like, a, it, it's something that requires a lot of patience. And I think, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a touchy subject, conservation and, uh, poaching and this and that. But I think that if you're attracted to plants and you're, you're attracted to the, it's a natural part of the of nature. You're attracted to it for its nature, its quality of nature. So it's like, I feel like it, it's, it almost is inextricably linked to having respect for nature, or at least in my mind, it, it ought to be. If, if you, if you want to display your, the amount of money that you have, I'd say do it with cars and houses, you know, don't do it with, with plants or animals. Yeah. You know, no, it, it, they're, they're living, living beings, beings too. too. Right. And, and they just don't survive when you take them out of their environment very, very often. Well, I think also, and you look at like, uh, you know, there was an article that was published earlier this year about uh, Lofofora williamsii being completely extirpated out of uh, Big Bend National Park. And, you know, I mean, some people could just brush it off and go, well, it's still all over northern Mexico and then still in other parts of South Texas and whatever. But the park visitors in the United States can't see it. No, no. And I think that, you know, it also the what kind of ripple effects a plant that has been a part of an ecosystem for so long, it's no longer there. What other insects or other type of microorganisms does that impact and how does that over the next 100 years 200 years how does that impact that ecosystem as a whole and i i don't know the answer exactly but you know it's a it's certainly an interesting thing to consider you know just, so in my opinion the more diversity we can maintain the better off we are well that's yeah i think that's one of the things that uh, i think i would like to try to drive home and what i do is showing that um, yeah, we collect these plants, we're growing these plants, we, we are fascinated by their uh, adaptations for living in their really arid and frankly unhospitable habitats, but they're barely, we're really not separate from them. I mean, we're all part, we're all part of it. And so I think that's one of the things with, uh, with our species, if you will, is like we like to label and we like to think of ourselves as sort of like the masters of the planet rather than like sh shepherds of the planet you know and i think that's probably a better approach for, for me anyway and I, I try to keep it personal because what works for me in my life i'm not saying that anybody else should do it or shouldn't do it but i like to think of myself when it comes to tending to the plants that i have in my greenhouse and in my in my yard as like i'm like a servant of the plants i'm there to like be of service to them and learn from them and appreciate them and uh yeah i mean well the, the other thing is if you take a plant out of the habitat, you don't know what other animals, insects, viruses that live um, with that plant in that environment. Right. You know, you don't know what that total environment is that where that plant lives. And when you move it someplace else out of that environment, you, now you know all it the plant doesn't have that to to help it subsist and now you've robbed all those other things of what would help them to subsist and you don't always you can't see that what can somebody do what can a what can your average collector your somebody who's just getting into cactus what are some super simple like action steps that they can take to, to contribute to conservation efforts outside of the habitat, ex situ conservation. 
My, I, mean, I think growing from seed is one. Well, that's true. And a good example of that was about two years ago, we had a lot of wildfires here in California. Mm -hmm. And although there were several different populations of Dudley Averidii, um up around Santa Cruz and a little further south, the wildfires seemed to hit every one of them. They almost almost wiped out, except for I think about one small population, wiped out all of the Dudley Variidae. Fortunately, Stephen McCabe, who's one of the nation's experts on Dudleys, had collected seed and grown them in the UC, uh, yeah, UC Santa Cruz greenhouse. So he and some UC students took the, after uh, a year or so, they took some of those plants and started populating back in the areas where Dudley Veridae had ground. Are those some of the ones that grow on the cliffs? Yeah. 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 Uh, along the ocean? Yeah. I think I saw a video actually. I think I watched like a little segment of them putting them back in yeah. and how, how difficult, difficult it was and wh why they were going through such lengths to put them where they were putting them because it's, you'd have to really go out of your way to go get them you right. know, and take them. You know, I, I think one of the things that like, I, I saw a little quote the other day, maybe it was a meme or something. And it was like the best time to plant a, a, a seed was 10 years ago, but the second best time to do it is now, you know? Yeah. And you know, the, the one thing I would like to, like if you can kind of imagine like, I don't know, there's something like 8,000 people that, that follow me. And this is obviously a, a fantasy kind of thought exercise, but could you imagine if 8,000 of those people sowed uh, 500, you know, copiapoa seeds today and kept them alive and then 10 years from now those were all there yeah. so, well that's that's a that's a lot of a lot yeah. of copia poas now in circulation and i think the nice thing to think about would be kind of imagining where you could go get one from a nursery that that is seed grown and you know it's not 300 dollars yeah. for a golf ball sized the, plant the, you know what i mean the other thing i promote seed growing is stephen mccabe sent me some seed of, for, of some Dudleys, uh, la well, last year and this year, both. But and we had him speak at the South Coast Club in November. And he said this year, again, very close to the fires, didn't get to the greenhouse, but he says they were very close within sight. And, and he, he says, says my, my whole Dudley collection, collection could, could have been, been wiped, wiped out, out very easily. easily. Wow. And he says, if we don't have you growing seed and him growing seed and some other nurseries growing seed, so that if somebody has a catastrophe, right, an earthquake or a or a fire or a you know w strong winds or something, or a friend of mine lived up near uh, Stockton, his greenhouse collapsed one winter for just from from all the rain. You know, you can have you know, all kinds of accidents. If you don't have other people doing some of the same thing, otherwise you can wipe out a whole thing. But you had the same thing in nature. There are some places in Mexico where, and you have some of the succulents in South Africa, the plant only grows in about a 20 by 20 foot area. Right, that's smaller than your backyard. That's smaller than your backyard. Yeah. And if there's a, a wildfire or any kind of calamity or if some, Collect, unknowing collector goes and collects a bunch or invasive invasive an invasive species like that, crowd, yeah. uh, suffocates it out that plant disappears right you've got to have it in other places so yeah seed growing is in my opinion the way to go i'm sorry <laughs> i i it's, well you, you get no debate for me i mean i'm in <laughs> well, full on agreement with you uh full yeah full on agreement with you, you when know. i when i first started hiking and camping um uh, I was told always leave the place at a campsite better than when you found it. Right. And so, you know, I kind of take that to my life as a whole. Right. Hopefully when I die, the place will be a better place because of what I've been able to do with plants than when I was born. Right. So can I take my lifetime and make it a better place? Hopefully. I would, I would say I think you have, you know, uh, you know, just in the time I've known you, you've certainly had an impact uh, on me and your, your willingness to sit down and have a conversation and, um, 
And I know that you certainly had an impact on Troy, you know, so, you know, if, if you had done nothing else in regards to plants, but impact me and him, you've certainly <laughs> made the world a better place, I think, you know, so, um, yeah. And obviously that's not all that you've done for sure, you know, but yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that it's fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating if you like watching, like you get a plant. I mean, I didn't even realize cactus flowered. You know, when I first got my first cactus, I didn't, it never occurred to me that they flowered. I never thought about it. And the first time I saw it, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> you know, and I get people every once in a while that'll send me a picture of a flower bud forming on their plant and they go, uh, what should I do here? And I'm like, kick back and enjoy the show, you know, <laughs> nothing. Um, but you know, if you like to watch your flower bud form on your gymnocalisium and start to look like this little, you know, Fabergé egg or something, and then all of a sudden it slowly opens up and I mean, it's just absolutely dazzling. And you think, how could this beautiful, soft, delicate looking flower be growing? And sometimes it'll even be folded around the sharp spines. And if you like to watch that growth process, then you, I would think, would absolutely love growing from seed because it is even more fascinating. And I'm learning things every single day. I recently did a video, which I haven't put out yet, but I did a shot a video with Peter. And I bought a bunch of Meloformis from him uh, two months ago or something like that. Well, I sort of haven't really been watering him that much because it's the winter time. And so I really, really pull things back, almost stopped completely. Well, there was a handful that I didn't buy from him out of the ba same batch. Um, because they were smaller. Well, those are bigger now than the ones I bought that I've had. So it's just interesting like to see like you can actually learn like learning how far you can push the plants, how the plants will differ from living out in habitat to what they will adapt to once they're being cultivated. Uh, I mean, it's just to me, it's absolutely like it's, fa it's fascinating. It's, it's like, like you're like, like a, a mad scientist, scientist you know? Yeah. So I, I feel I need to give one cautionary statement. Okay. I really enjoy growing things from seed. And it took me probably 10 to 15 years, if not more, to kind of understand and develop how to, and de develop my technique for how to do that. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out how a cactus seedling can ever survive on the desert. Oh, I know. It's I mean, I find, I find <laughs> seedlings in my pots that all of a sudden are pea size. Like, right. I, I, I never knew that they were there. And right. I know they had to have been there for at least a year. Right. Because if I try to grow them in a coffee cup, in a, in a baggie, which is how I usually start things, I keep it wet, moist for almost a year. Right. Trying, you know, if I let it dry out, I'll lose about half of them. Mm -hmm. um, and you can lose them from drying out. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And, and um, you know, fungus gnats like it if it's too moist. And, I mean, it's just growing th from seed is not for the guy that wants it now. No. you got to have some patience. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and so if you're one of these guys that I want to have it now, I'd say buy a seedling from somebody else. Um, yeah, if you really want to see something grow quick, graft it. Oh, yeah. Or buy it grafted. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've got a handful of plants that I'm going to be putting up for sale for soon, pretty soon that are that are grafted. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of having a grafted plant. But, I mean, again, that's just, you know, you, you as you meet more people, and you see more ways of doing things, and you see plants in people's collections, and you go, wow, that's amazing. I can't believe how many heads that turbany carpus has. This usually doesn't clump like that. How did you, oh, it's grafted. Really? It doesn't look grafted? Because yeah, well, that's, it's, it's an inch and a half worth of topsoil hiding the grafting stock. He goes, but it's been in there for you know three years. That graft, it's probably yeah. just rooted now. You know, And it's like, oh, so you can actually get yourself a more sizable specimen quicker. You just have to, it's, it isn't, again, it's not, it's not just simple, you know, it isn't simple. And frankly, if you want to get big specimen sized plants, there's a b bunch of badass mammalarias that you can go get that are faster growing and mu yeah. much more available and do all kinds of cool things and have beautiful flowers that are big, that, the, you know. You talk about grafting. Um, I was given a Neoporterra napina, not a fast growing plant. No. Um, I was given two pups, so I planted one pup, 
and it's still about the same size. It was about an inch long. The other pup I cut exactly in the middle and I grafted the top and the bottom. I now have one pup, uh, a pup on each that are about four inches long and one of them has already bloomed already. Right. I mean, in, and that was in four to five months. You can grow plants, well, obviously four to five times faster on a graft and then grow it up and then ungraft it and try to reroot it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, I think we've got I think we got more than enough footage, okay. like uh, uh, as far as what we need for the video. Anything anything that you thought of last minute that maybe you want to add or. And did the same thing. And yeah, the prickly pear was here, and the echinocactus was antelonius. There was two of them, one there and one over here. Right. And there was five um, epilantha, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mammillaria micro micromeris. Okay. No, e shoot, I can't think of the name. It looks like a half of a golf ball in the desert. Uh, I'm not sure. Or smaller. I, I, I can kind of picture it, but I'm not sure. It's real it. dense spines and yeah. real white. Um, and. I mean, what I saw was like this size, you know, size of a dime, yeah. little tiny things. And there was five of them over here in this corner. Went back five years later, there was five in this corner of the picture. And I knew I had laid out the, the clothesline the second time because I'd left little stones to hold the corners down. Right. And then and since then, I've come to find out that that particular mammillaria has, has a fairly short lifetime. And that's why nobody really collects it. And any time I've had it, it doesn't last more than about three or four years. So there's a few plants that just naturally, I mean, but I didn't realize, I guess there, you know, the, the population stayed the same, but I didn't realize there was that in five years, there'd be that much change. Yeah. You know, that just kind of blew my mind. Yeah. Well, that's something you, and, and that's the stuff where most people that are collecting plants never see that because you're not going out there. You know, if, uh, people go out to the desert maybe to see cactus once or twice in their lifetime. They're certainly not going to the same spot multiple times. And the last video that I did, uh, the spot where I filmed and shot those plants at, I, I frankly kind of knew where I was going to find what plants because I had already been there. Uh, I'd been there, I'd probably been there five or six times, definitely every season and seeing the differences, seeing the plants in flower. I mean, it's incredible to see the desert in different seasons. Oh, yeah. Because it can look real. Like when I went out there just last time, it's dead as a doornail. There's, you don't see <laughs> anything. You don't see a lizard, not a snake. It's nothing, nothing. Uh, and then you go back in like the springtime and there are swarms of different types of bugs all over certain plants and there's, everything's in flower and you see seed pods and it's just like, it's a different place completely. You know? Yep. And it is interesting to see, you know, you see like, when I go out, I see a lot of like, a lot of plants, uh, and I actually noticed this last time, there was a plant that I had seen before, and it was tipped over this time. And there's just like rocks, you know, rocks had fallen, whatever happened from above, and shifted it, and it, it wasn't, well, it looked like it was hanging on by a thread, basically, you know, but you get to see how things change over time. And thinking of it in terms of, you know, I, I've been out there, so that's that's a point we years. didn't make is the joy of seeing things change over time. Yeah. Well, and realizing that the amount of time, if, if I went out to that place once a year for the rest of my life, that is nothing in the span of the time scale of, you know, in a geological sense. Uh, it's nothing. So then you start looking and learning more about the environment and it starts to look much more alive the more you learn about it and i think that for me is you know and i guess i guess really is i'm a little i'm disenchanted with city life to a certain extent i'm disenchanted with watching tv completely and movies i, I can't do it um so for me what where can i find something that is going to be fascinating that's going to keep my, my brain active and my body active is going out into the desert and learning about everything. Cause like the, you see it and you're like, wow, that's fascinating. I wonder what it is. And then you read about it and you're like, wow, it's even more fascinating than I could have ever imagined it, just seeing it. So the more you learn, the more 
vivid everything kind of becomes and the more I, for me the more I can yeah. just appreciate it and, and and it becomes so rich and so even even living you know where it's crowded and you know po- overpopulated and there's like pollution and all these problems or whatever I can still like really get passionate and connect with the plants that are basically everything I mean some people move I mean moved to Arizona and and pace in Arizona I mean out in the sticks right yeah uh, because they like to see that change. On the other hand, from a society point of view, you're not close to doctors, you know. So as you get older, I kind of like to be not too far from a hospital or a doctor if I think I want to live too long. But my mother, I go back to the story I told in the first one. Right. She enjoyed coming out and just seeing what was in bloom every day. Sure because there was something different, and then she would tell me about it when I got home. You know, I think one of the things... And I, as you, that goes back to, you know, enjoyment of the change. Me too. You know, I think one of the things uh, that I really like about, like, seeing nature at work, it's working perfectly without my help at all. And I think for me, it helps me to feel a little more right-sized in the grand scheme of things, you know? Like, I have to make a lot of decisions as a father and, you know, and what I'm going to do and how, okay, i, I got to make a lot of decisions in my life where I sort of am running the show to a certain extent. But I'm not really running the show at all in the grand scheme of things. And I think be, being able to take a moment and pause and just admire nature and see it for, I mean, it, it's unbelievably grand it for me it helps me to feel a little more right-sized i mean going out in the desert for example not, not everybody can do this but putting the drone up and then going up as high as it'll go and just looking down i can't even see myself that's why i wear the orange beanie all the time because then i can see myself way high up if i could if i didn't have that on I, i'm nothing i'm just an insignificant speck on the floor of the desert like everything else i went out to break i've gone out to brago springs several times and it's and it's an area called fonts point and you want to go out there about dusk because you go up on this little ridge and you look out and it is one of the most desolate spires of just mud sticking up for almost far as far as you can see it's and then you as the sun sets you get all the shadows changing across that stuff it's it's awesome yeah but I've stood on that ridge and I can see the edge of this point. Yeah. On the shadow of the of the uh, escarpment over there. Right. And there's no shadow for you. There's a whole shadow of the point, and you can see it move. Right. As it as the sun sets, it goes up. You know. But the, you're so you're insignificant. Yeah. You're too thin to be to show up. Right. <laughs> yeah. No. It's, it makes you feel so small. God, it's kind of good, I know I'm there, but I'm not there, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, that's where we get to, you know, I mean, I don't want to get too, like, like woo-woo or philosophical or anything, but, like, we're human beings, and it gives you an opportunity to, to be. Just be. Just just be amongst a, a visual this grand thing mystery that we're a part of. That, I, I, that I heard you know? was life is, uh, everybody's life is kind of like a big cloth yeah. and you're just one thread among all the others that are woven together yeah. you know and it's uh yeah you know, we, we, we we're getting off into some uh some philosophy <laughs> so territory here but yeah i mean it, it is but that's the thing though is and that's where the plants for me they always take me there they take me to some it's it's not it's way different than you know uh for me, at least, it's it's not just oh, I've got these beautiful plants that I like because they're beautiful. It's you know, it's 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 way more internalized and personal. For, but for I find me it a challenge to grow all this stuff. Yeah, it's a very challenging, especially when you have. I mean, look at this table. You got <laughs> so many different things. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, you got to remember. Oh, well, what you you end up having relationships with plants that are akin to a relationship you would have with a person almost uh, but in a weird way you know the plant 
it, it, it's almost a it's almost a, a you can trust the plant more than you can trust a person almost in a weird way like you, you, it's it's a it's a different it's not like having a relationship with a person but in some ways you really do have a very close relationship with them where you get to know them and like you it almost becomes intuitive like looking at them you know like okay this is what it means it's uh, it, it you know uh like i watered my greenhouse today and like first thing this morning as i started looking at things and you know certain things are still flowering and you know they're they're starting to sag and look like they're getting thirsty and it's been like 80 degrees pretty consistently for a few hours at least every day in there it's like i'm gonna hit these guys with some water mm -hmm. you know and keep them going it's like it just gives me it gives me something else to think about other than myself too right you know so it gets me out of my head and it really it becomes something far different than just a you know a beautiful plant to have you know but that's where it started for me for sure it was like you know they were just like uh i had orchids at first not my thing no, they not, take a lot of care they take a lot of care and they're not very pretty most of the time yeah i've got it but yeah, you know, I think that, I think we got I think we got more than. What is this little guy? That one? Yeah. 